she didn't, but she uh, would have had, except my son is doing board exams, so he has a board French exam this week in Northern Irish exam next Monday. So it's just because uh, she's on her own with him. Just get him up to school, get him to the job. Yeah, it's the normal yeah. cyclical yeah. things, you know. So it's yeah, it's a way the routine is not is is not it's you know, not a good time for No, him. no, no. He and he he doesn't like it, so yeah. 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 And
Yes, he would mention her actually. And he lost one other as well. You might get more bodies, but that might not be on. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Conor Mulls. I'm the head of the National Maritime College of Ireland, and I'd like to welcome you here to this afternoon's session, Marine Environmental Law. Before I uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Benedict Sage Fuller, I'd like to maybe lay out the format of today's proceedings. Each of our speakers have 30 minutes uh, to present and to take questions. And as always, time is uh, the challenge, is the enemy. So you'll forgive me if I am ruthless in uh, not just taking the questions, but maybe stopping them if uh, we go on past our time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Benedict Sage Fuller. Benedict is a lecturer here at the Faculty of Law in UCC. Previously, she has worked on various EU and national funded projects related to maritime safety and environmental protection. Benedict has been involved in UNCTAD since 2009 on the port management program, and more recently on an EU project on e-guided vessels. She has recently published her book, the book launch of which is tonight, The Precautionary Principle in Marine Environmental Law with Special Reference to High Risk Vessels. So, Dr. Fuller. Um, thank you very much, Connor. So I'll bring up my um, presentation. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was speaking last year here, and um, even though he's not here, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Owen McIntyre for organizing the conference. I think everybody will agree that it's a great success so far. And. Um, so the subject of my talk is unmanned uh, shipping. So this is related to the project that uh, Conor Moles just mentioned on e-guided vessels. Um, it's a project that uh, I've been involved with since September 2012. And the purpose of, pre of this presentation is actually more to raise far many, many more questions than giving answers. Um, it's a very exciting project on unmanned navigation. So the, the name of the project is MUNIN, um, Maritime Unmanned Navigation Through Intelligence in Networks. As you will see uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, we are um, the Irish partner in it. There's seven other partners who are all from um, Northern Europe. And MUNIN, I discovered, is actually the name of the raven, one of the two ravens that it was charged with finding out about world news uh, and reporting back to uh, God Odin. This is it. So that's where the name comes from, and they uh, found a good acronym to go around. It's actually quite fitting to the topic of the project because, as you will realize, a lot of it has to do with communications and uh, networks. So the project started in about a year and a half, and it has another year and a half to go. Um, I just gave some information there to, to give you an idea of how it is, and um, 
I think, and I'm pretty sure about that, that we are actually the only uh, project in the EU currently working on the topic of unmanned shipping from a commercial point of view. There's a little bit of research going on from a military point of view in the EU and in, in, uh, in the US, for example, but f looking at it from a purely commercial point of view, as far as I know, we're the only project. So it's, it's quite exciting as a lawyer to be part of that at the moment. The objective, as it was uh, defined at the beginning of the project, was to develop an autonomous ship concept as a combination of automated decision systems and remote con control via a shore-based station. So that was the initial definition. And what I want to do through this presentation is just explain what this unmanned ship might look like. At the moment, it's obviously just a concept. And even in a year and a half, uh, when the project ends, it's still going to be a concept. You're not going to have a ship floating and ready to go. But we're exploring a lot of issues. So the long-term ob objective is the unmanned ship. And it could be 20 years down the line possibly uh, because of the legal obstacles along the way, far more than because of the technological issues. But that's the, the name of the game. In the short term, uh, there are more um, immediate issues that could be relevant for shipping in terms of efficiency, safety, sustainability for existing vessels. So that, that has, uh, this project should bring an advantage as well. The partners, so I've listed them here, Fraunhofer Institute is this huge research institute in Hamburg, and they have a center for logistic, maritime logistics. Marine Tech are, again, a very reputable university in Norway, um, as is Chalmers University in Gothenburg. We have Horschule Wismar in Hostok in Germany, and therefore, again, they are very reputable, and what they are bringing a lot, well, in this project is um, they have a lot of experience and big machine in terms of engine simulation and ship simulation, so very useful. Aptomar are um, <coughs> a company that is working a lot in sensors. Uh, MarineSoft are into software for marine for shipping. Marokka in Reykjavik are into sensors as well and then ourselves. Um, so all of the other partners are involved in the technology development aspect and us in UCC are doing the legal analysis. I also want to mention the advisory board because that's very important um, for us to have a people external to the project who are going to be critical about what we do. And again, just to mention the quality of those people because for us it's kind of a safety net to know that they can raise flags if they can see that we're going wrong somewhere. So Mike Hadley who used to be with Ayala uh, Professor Jens Fröse is with this university in Bremen. We have somebody from um, a ship and rig management software company, Per Handers Koyen, um, somebody from a shipping company, and somebody from a classification society, DNV um, GL. So um, these people are following what we're doing, and uh, we're presenting the results to them on a regular basis, and they give us feedback. Um, also, <coughs> Um, you might have heard on the news, I don't know, um, there is the project and unmanned shipping in general has been getting a, a little bit, well, a fair amount of media attention, relatively speaking, obviously, but even mainstream media have picked up on it. Bloomberg, Die Welt, the German newspaper, are actually talking about the project, Munin, in terms of, in the context of unmanned shipping. The economists, um, they don't talk about Munin, the project, but they are talking about unmanned shipping and there's other references there. The slides will be up on the conference website so you can have a look yourself. The UCC role in the project, obviously because I'm working as a lawyer on this, um, the analysis of legal issues. So I've put them in a table. Again, as I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, at the moment I have far more questions than answers, but these are the areas that we have so far identified in terms of where we're going to need to work in an analyzing the law. So the sensor systems, um, and I'll go into most of them as the presentation goes on. Um, maneuvering system remotely. Uh, maintenance, a big, big issue, and which raises issues in terms of uh, as the theme of this conference is environmental protection. Uh, interesting questions of um, foreseeability of damage and things like that. The engine information system, um, the engine efficiency system, 
the architecture in, of the system in terms of uh, what modules talk to which, uh, the shore control center and the functional indicators. So these are the areas which I will develop a little bit as we go on. I also wanted to mention the people working on the project. So Faribor Safari worked on it uh, last year for 12 months and did remarkable work, which I will show a little bit. Helen Noble, who is also presenting in this session, is involved since January and will stay on um, uh, for the foreseeable future on this. And we're really, really pleased to have somebody of her caliber um, involved in this project. And I'm obviously a staff here ongoing. My involvement is ongoing. <clears throat> From an environmental perspective, what I was trying to show is how difficult the task is because this unmanned ship is going in all directions and you could really sit down and rewrite the whole of marine environmental law just to fit it for unmanned shipping. So these areas, emissions, engine efficiency, maintenance, collision, navigation, in terms of the crew, unmanned shipping, obviously you would think, well, there will be no crew but you still have to have crew in the shore control center. And there is issues of education. What kind of education will they need to be able to monitor the ship? Fatigue, how long should they be working? How, many, how long should their shifts be, etc.? Technology reliability is, is the obvious one. And uh, another one that, which has emerged in earlier uh, meetings um, not so long ago, the latency of messages, and again, I will explain how that's relevant, and I put other because there will be other things. And all that relates to the question of what kind of risk to the environment is the unmanned ship going to pose compared to normal shipping. And from that, we have to look at the standards, the current standards in, in international shipping law uh, and marine environmental law, um, the foreseeability of the risk. How is that going to change? How are we going to assess the risk that the ship is posing to the environment when it's on man in those conditions. And one important aspect, and again, it's here, um, and it will have to be taken into account, is the fact that currently shipping law operates on a basis of redundancy. You have somebody on board in the engine room in the bridge who can do something about a problem when it arises. If you have an unmanned ship, you're functioning on a no redundancy basis, which is the situation, for example, in the aviation industry, but not in the shipping industry. So from a legal point of view, we have questions here. How are we going to, or will we ever be able to shift the mindset of, of lawmakers? And then from there, you can start answering questions of liability, regulation, insurance, etc., from a national and an international point of view. So that's, that's where I'm saying there's a lot and a lot of questions, very few answers so far, but um, in order to get, um, to start answering those questions, we need to understand what the ship is going to look like. So for that, um, we can look at what we call the, hum the Munin hypothesis. So is what are we trying to achieve in the short time frame that we have, so that the unmanned ship can sail on an intercontinental voyage with at least the same safety and efficiency levels as a manned ship. So that is the objective that we are trying to demonstrate within the project. Obviously, there's a lot of parameters within, within that from a technological point of view, and that has knock-on effects in terms of legal questions. The ship itself will have varying degrees of autonomy. So it can go from being fully autonomous unmanned to being um, um, partly remote, partly automated with maybe a service team on board, uh, somebody who, who could be intervening if the need be. And it could also be um, automated with a crew on board. So there's various degrees of autonomy um, which depend on where the ship is how much automation can actually happen on the ship. Um, so there's a lot of parameters which make the legal analysis very interesting, that's to say the least. Um, there is, in the context of legal research, there's very, very little undertaken at this stage. So we're really plowing a field um, that is really wild at the moment. And in terms of law, there is nothing. That's as simple as that. Um, so we, we have to try to anticipate what the ship is going to look like, to try to think what kind of standards we're going to need 
to achieve this hypothesis of um, a ship sailing on an intercontinental voyage with at least the same safety and efficiency levels as a manned ship. In terms of the preliminary research that we did last year, so this was Faribor Safari, he did the groundwork. In, in a way, it was extremely difficult for this part of the, of the legal analysis to go on because um, the, the, well, the, the technological research was not very clear, was just starting. So it was very hard to give answers to non-existent legal questions, if you follow me. So what he did was to um, look at the substantive objectives of current standards, legal requirements that exist in marine environmental law um, to try to identify those standards and say, okay, once we've extracted those standards, then we can see how can the unmanned ship match them or if it can. And then we can go back and say, well, there's going to need an, an amendment under such and such conventions, etc. So he looked at SOLAS, coal regs, MARPOL, etc. All of these relevant conventions were looked at. And there was a reasoning by analogy with current laws to try to anticipate how we would need changes. Specifically, um, what was looked at was collision avoidance, environmental protection, consideration, technical cooperation such as piracy and security, and shipping efficiency in general. So the result of this first year of research was um, a, a, the beginning of an outline of the standard of care and due diligence that would be required for unmanned ships in order to operate in reasonably predictable conditions. That's all very vague, but that's, a, that's as far as we could go at the, at the time. Um, year two now, um, we have identified a, a little bit more specific legal issues with Helen and started to think about the potential impact on liability. And the assessment will be carried out in more detail from September 2014 uh, for 12 months. Now, I've put this, um, and literally, this was in a report that was uh, made public uh, only Monday. So this is really, really fresh off the press from the other partners on the project. This is what the architecture of the ship would look like and the interfaces. And it's kind of, I just want to guide you through it um, just a little bit to understand from a legal point of view where we're trying to find the analysis. So you have the, sh the other ships on the shore. So the ship is, is this part here, and it's going to have to communicate with other ships and shore. Um, you have the shore control center more particularly. So that's on the shore, and that's con com composed of the shore bridge control, remote fine navigation, and the shore engine control. And then the ship is here. Um, here you have the autonomous ship controller, which is kind of the, um, <clears throat> the intelligent part of, the, of the, the ship, and it controls autonomous navigation and the autonomous engine monitoring, so the bridge and the engine, roughly speaking, in terms of automation, are called the ANS, Autonomous Navigation System, and Autonomous Engine Monitoring and Control, the AEMC. All these acronyms, it's hard to get your head around them, but um, that, that part is where the decisions in relation to automation is, are going to take place. Um, that relies on the sensors, for example, the advanced sensor module. So, and again here, we'll, we'll go into what kind of legal issues so far we can see are, could be problematic. An integrated bridge system and the engine automation system. That part here um, is not very developed. It's probably outside the scope of the project itself, but it's still going to be important from the future on manned ship if it happens. The line of sight communication system, including AIS, etc., and then the rendezvous control unit. Um, if the ship needs to be literally taken over, if something is going wrong with it and the automation is not working anymore and the remote control is not working anymore. So what we're focusing on in terms of legal analysis at the moment is the navigation system, which is, has to be automated, the um, engine, so here you have the engine, the navigation and then the bridge which is integrated. And the communication controller is really about making the ship talk to the shore control center. I hope I'm explaining this as, 
I'm trying to do my best because as a lawyer, it's really interesting to sit in those meetings with the technical experts and it requires a lot of work to process all this. So if you take, I'm just going back to here, the sensor module. So I'm just going through now some of the legal issues that we've identified. The sensors, we were told by our partners specialized in sensors, it looks like they're not gonna be able to <clears throat> identify exactly every single object that they're detecting. So you're gonna have sensors on the ships and cameras, and they may be looking at something coming in the way of the ship, but not knowing what it is. It could be something completely harmless, but it could be something potentially dangerous for the ship. So it's a problem for navigation, but from a legal point of view, question mark, what do we do? Do we need to have a threshold then to start making decisions below and above the threshold as to if it's something dangerous then the ship needs to change course, if it's something completely harmless there's no need, it can carry on, etc. Something that um, if you compare with the shipping, normal shipping situation, if you had an officer of the watch, you could say well at least he or she could tell you what it is, but then something else that's coming up is that well he also may be asleep and not see it at all and so there are advantages and there are disadvantages to this you're going to detect a lot more than if you have a crew on board you're not going to be able to know exactly what it is at all times so that raises a lot of questions in terms of foreseeability of the damage risk in general for environmental protection Looking at the autonomous navigation system, um, for the project, they're focusing on two basic functions, collision avoidance and weather routing. So it's going to be equivalent, it has to be equivalent to the, the lookout that the officer of the watch would carry out. <clears throat> and in manned conditions, you have an, an integrated bridge system, which interfaces between, which is the interface for the bridge crew diagnostics and monitoring. In unmanned conditions, you're going to have your integrated bridge, but it also has to be able to communicate with the shore control center. That's going to be absolutely critical. Um, whether communication is done um, in an automated manner or if the shore control center has to take over and have more direct control. So the SCC, which is the shore control center, will be at least a support for a number of um, functions the normal autonomous operations, they have to at least monitor what's going on, remote maneuvering if necessary, engine control and bridge control and all of this again will raise a number of issues comparing with what an officer of the watch would do in normal conditions. Um, so the emerging legal issues in the shore control centre, how many personnel are you going to have to have there, what kind of qualifications are they going to need to have? Um, you're going to have to have technicians, equipment specialists, but also a captain. For how long, what, how long are their shifts going to be? These kind of questions. All bearing in mind the requirements under, for example, a CCW convention um, and see what are the recurrent requirements. Obviously, the unmanned ship is, would not fit under that convention, but we are going to have to propose amendments. Um, routing and weather constraints from the point, point of view of collision and navigation. The autonom autonomous navigation system is going to have to deal with that. So it's probably that it's going to be programmed in advance and they're going to have to deal. But if there's a change of weather, that's going to have to be monitored from the shore control center side. And then we get into more technical, real technical issues of messages. So. <clears throat> um, the, me the messages have to be as far as possible standardized. So we're, we are looking at uh, what is going on IMO side from the point of view of e-navigation, how IALA and the International Telecommunications Union are looking at the standardization of messages currently to see how those can be applied to online shipping. And if they can't, then what needs to be done so that we have standardized messages worldwide. And then there's further issues of data transmission, storage, accessibility. Here again, there are international bodies currently looking at that for sh uh, manned shipping. And the question is again, um, how are those standards that are developed at the moment uh, or that are 
current at the moment, uh, how will they be applicable to the unmanned ship? Um, so that's from the point of view of autonomous navigation system because once those standards are defined, um, it's easier to relate back into the current framework of marine environmental protection, for example, and look at issues of liability. Remote maneuvering, um, there's a basic issue of technological reliability. Um, the ship has to be able to be stirred from remotely from the shore control center, so you have to be able to rely on the technology, and there you have to look at the international standardization. The latency of messages, I was mentioning that, between the ship and the shore control center, for a non-expert like, like me, you'd be saying, well, it's easy, messages go back and forth, but there's an issue of latency. What if it takes five seconds for a message to go from shore control center to the ship, and five seconds to go back? or 10 or 20 seconds, you're adding time to the maneuvering, which normally wouldn't be there if you had an, an, a crew on board. So at the moment, the project experts are looking at VSAT, so very small aperture terminal, which is low cost, and in Mars, in Marsat communication, which is very expensive, and that would only be as a fallback position. Um, and to give you an idea, um, the latency for VSAT messages would be something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 seconds, which is fairly fast and very acceptable. Um, other issues that may arrive with, if the, the ship is going to berth, how many people do you need on the, in the port to actually do the berthing uh, requirements? And uh, the line of sight communications, again, if the ship needs to be controlled from uh, near the coast. Um, how the, this is going to be done if you have no crew on board? And uh, how is AIS going to be used um, on, on board the ship? And here there's already an obvious legal issue that has been spotted that um, there needs to be harmonization between requirements on the coal regs and SOLAS for AIS. The engine. Uh, Helen, Helen and I favorite topic. It's the hardest for us to understand. In a way, if there was a, a man lawyer involved, it would be easier. <laughs> but um, So as I was saying, unmanned shipping will operate on a no redundancy basis, um, especially in, in the engine room. You're going to have a ship where there is no crew on board. If there's a problem in the engine in the middle of the ocean, there is no redundancy. It's like an aircraft. Um, <clears throat> in normal conditions, Bridge and engine room are automated to some extent, and there is a human interface with the engine crew and the officer of the watch. For unmanned shipping, there's going to be neither, um, which are, and they're going to be replaced by machines, the um, automated ship controller and automated engine monitoring control centers. So there's going to be a lot of questions there in terms of reliability, uh, liability, and especially in alert situations. And uh, this is a very new take on shipping and shipping law, uh, very different from the existing situation. So it is a question of mindset and um, something which is linked to maintenance. Um, maintenance will have to be planned very carefully because in a way problems will have to be anticipated before um, the ship leaves the shore and the maintenance plan is going to obviously uh, include some dates when the, the ship is calling at certain ports where certain aspects of the engine is going to be looked at. Um, and as, this is again research, as the unmanned ship is used more and more, it's going to be able to trend events and start spotting early warning faults and integrating them in the maintenance planning issue. From a legal point of view, as time goes on, it means that problems will be more foreseeable. If they're more foreseeable, that has a knock-on effect on the seaworthiness, the legal definition of seaworthiness of a ship um, and foreseeability of damage. So again, it feeds back into the general, um, into the general um, framework, legal framework. Um, I'm, I think I'm going back to, I'm going to go back to maintenance later on. Oh yeah, the model used, the partners that are doing that is our marine tech, so they're in Norway, and they're looking at what the Norwegian Petroleum Authority are using for their rigs in terms of maintenance as a model. 
Um, the human factor and the shore control center. So the user interface in the shore control center is going to be critical. Um, so Chalmers, the Swedish partner in Gothenburg, they conducted a focus group um, last June with bridge officers. And the question was, what do you need to have in a shore control center to monitor and remote control an unmanned vessel? So basically, if you were a captain sitting on shore instead of being in your, in your ship, what would you want to see on your screen to be able to do the job properly? So the answers um, are very comprehensive. I only picked a few from the report just to put them here. Um, but first of all, the personnel is going to have to be able to use the relevant data and make the right decisions so <clears throat> in order to monitor the ships, do indirect control, direct control, etc. And that's back to the question of the kind of education these people are going to have. In terms of visualization, they'll have to have a map. Um, <clears throat> they'll have to be able to look at functional indicators and particularly the danger indicators. And it has to be relatively simple, but not too simple so it can pick some situations. In terms of the ship motions, that's something they highlighted. They want to know how the ship is doing a habit further down. Is there a roll? What's the roll period if there is slamming, etc.? Because all of these are potential indicators of something that could harm the ship and cause a damage. So that has to be visualized from the shore control center. And there could be, um, well, it's suggested that there should be specialized, specialist stations in the shore control center. So for the officer of the watch, for engine control, for maintenance. Um, and so again, a lot of legal issues are raised, particularly in terms of the type of personnel, length of their shift, and, and the user interface as well. How well is that going to represent what is going on on the ship? So in conclusion, um, a year and a half into the project, we have now a much better picture of what the Munin and Man ship is going to look like. Um, and in terms of legal issues now, we know more where we need to start um, looking. So standards, harmonization of standards, in terms of risk of environmental damage in particular, and foreseeability of this risk. So these are all the many aspects of the unmanned ship. And fundamentally, what's really interesting for an academic like me is, is this really a new approach to shipping law with this no redundancy basis and how is that going to work? We're hoping to schedule a meeting with the legal committee of the IMO in a couple of months to just show um, this is the project and uh, we don't know what to expect, but um, anyway, we'll see. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Saj Fuller. I'd like to open up to the floor for some questions, please. And maybe for the, the sake of good order and for the benefit of all, um, when you ask the question, if you could introduce yourself fully and your designation. Do we have any questions? Absolutely, and um, that's something that came up in the last meeting actually, um, the issue of security, but also um, something that also came up in the conversation, um, immigration, illegal immigration, and um, people on board who should not be on board, etc. So yeah, from the point of view of security, there is the security of the ship itself. In a way, our initial thought is that they could be less likely to be the targets of, let's say, terrorist attacks or because there is no, or even piracy, because there is no personnel on board. But the, the other side is that, um, again, our experts are telling us it's very easy, apparently, to fake AIS messages. And so there could be some hackers simulating the ship movements and actually taking the ship elsewhere unbeknown to the, uh, to the shore control center. So that is definitely a big part of that and part of the, the list of hazards that we have to deal with uh, in, in the project, yeah. Yeah, we, again, something that it, it came up at the last uh, meeting and we chose not to um, deal with it now because 
we think this is going to be the insurers will decide to insure if they see something viable from all aspects. But definitely, that is that's in included in the in the description of the project. So we're going to have to deal with that, but probably later on. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, the lady in the glasses. No one behind you. <laughs> that's you. That's, that's a very good question. Um, to answer your first question, the, the driver behind this project is, um, it's not just cost reduction, it's also that um, to facilitate um, training of crew, et cetera, where it seems to be harder nowadays to find crews that are willing to go on longer journeys and to try to find an alternative to that. Also because, um, unmanned ships are being looked at anyway, so you know we wanted to have a project on that. And the cost-benefits analysis is going to be a big part of the uh, assessment for the third year of the project because, um, yeah, it could potentially be an expensive shift, and that's why um, there are mid-term solutions that are being looked at which could be outcomes of the project and which could be implemented on exec existing ship without making them unmanned, but more automation, which could be advantages coming out of the project at this point. I'll take one more question from Fort, the gentleman with the grey. No, that, that's exactly the, the kind of issues that we're grappling with in terms of, um, you know, what happens on the ship stays on the ship type of, this is one issue that actually Helen brought up at the last meeting. Um, one of the new approaches to shipping, uh, currently it's all in the master's head and it's a matter of finding out what went on. Here, if this happens, we're going to have databases with all the information recorded. So that, has, that is going to have knock-on effects on, on the whole liability system there. And again, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, at this point we have a lot of questions and all of this needs to be, and we probably won't be able to give answers during the life of the project to everything, but at least these issues will be raised. And um, yeah, it's, it's only one project working on this. Yeah. We have two minutes left. Captain Cook, would you like to ask one question? not something that we have actually addressed head on. Um, it's been mentioned that there, as I was mentioning, some issues look like they could be better dealt with remotely. And I know you probably don't like hearing that. Uh, but, but again, maybe not, for example, the issue of the sensors. 
we know there is something, but we don't know what it is, and we have no way of finding out what it is. Th these are kind of issues. So far in the project, it hasn't been addressed head on like that, but in various areas like that, in discrete areas. Mm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And one of the objectives, the midterm objectives of the project is to actually address these kind of issues, to try to provide solutions to existing problems. Because we're well aware that the unmanned ship could be 20 years before it ever happens, if it happens even. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, sorry, if I may, uh, Ronan Long uh, from the University in Galway. I, I think it's a, it's a very important paper, and there, there are some important parallels in other industries and indeed in other shall we say, areas of sector regulation. I'm thinking in particular of the aviation industry and uh, the debates uh, currently underway in the United States about the use of drones. So the, the, I, I think that certainly in our lifetime, we will see automated ships. And uh, we've already seen automated trains. And if, 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 if asked perhaps 20 years ago, which would I prefer, automated ships or automated trains, I've said, I, I'll take the ships, please. So uh, I come back to Bronya's uh, point there, which is it's, it's, uh, what's going to drive, shall we say, development will be market forces. Uh, is, is, is this going to be a cost issue? And I'm delighted to see that the regulatory aspects of the uh, concept are being addressed from day one. And that's, that's the important element mm -hmm. of this exceptional European project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. OK, thank you. Our next speaker today is Professor Ronan Long. Professor Long read for his PhD at Trinity College. He holds the Jean Monnet Chair of European Commercial Law at the School of Law at NUIG and was the first recipient of the Michael Manahan Research Fellowship. Ronan is the author and co-author of several books in the area including marine resource law and enforcing the common fisheries policy. He is the co-editor of Law, Science and Ocean Management and Legal Challenges in Maritime Security. Professor Long has worked previously for the European Commission and has held a commission with the Irish Naval Service. Professor Long. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairperson, and uh, it's a great privilege to be back here in University College Cork. Uh, I started out my uh, days here as a student in the law faculty and I'd like to commend Owen and his colleagues here in the uh, law school for hosting this conference and particularly for providing us with the opportunity to discuss uh, some very exciting topics. Um, I have a very elaborate paper which is gone for peer review and it will be available uh, to everybody at this conference in due course. Um, I'd also like to point out that in, in the course of this morning's presentations, of course, there, there were a number of issues highlighted, which I'll try and pick up in, in the course of this presentation, and I, a particular focus this afternoon on offshore renewable energy development uh, challenges and conundrums in EU law and policy. So I suppose I, I, I'm pitching in at the level that uh, Owen articulated this morning in between the international and uh, the national level. I'd also like to pick up on one or two of the themes uh, that uh, Anne-Marie flagged in her presentation and indeed in some of the questions that uh, Val posed as the, the chair in this morning's session. Um, that being said, of course, uh, it's a very dynamic area of law and indeed it's something which is uh, evolving quite rapidly. Uh, some of the contemporary issues are, uh, have been addressed uh, in a, in a very similar fashion in the petroleum industry perhaps in the 1960s and we're now in a position uh, uh, to address a new sector uh, uh, in the context of regulation where perhaps right, we should uh, learn the, the, the lessons from previous generations and apply them going forward. Uh, now, my paper has a, a fairly elaborate section on uh, 
uh, the European Treaty provisions as a way of backdrop. I only have one slide on the treaty provisions this morning. Uh, I'll give you an update on the status of the, the offshore renewable wind energy industry at a pan-European Union level. And uh, thirdly, I'll pick up on the themes uh, raised by Anne-Marie and indeed Owen in relation to spatial management uh, measures and specifically I'll address this draft directive on maritime spatial planning and integrated coastal zone management which is uh, coming down the tracks pretty rapidly within the European institutions. And finally I'll talk about some of the challenges and conundrums in EU energy law. Okay, the slides on, on the treaty, at a European Union level, we have two treaties, the Treaty on European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Both of those treaties were uh, adopted at, at Lisbon. So occasionally we refer to these treaties as the, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, in Article 194, Paragraph 1, it clearly sets out what the European Union's policy on energy shall uh, aim to achieve. Uh, Firstly, to ensure the functioning of the energy market. Uh, secondly, to ensure security of energy supply in the Union. Uh, thirdly, to promote energy efficiency and energy saving and the development of new and renewable forms of energy. And uh, fourthly, to promote the interconnection of energy networks. So I suppose my start point in, in terms of the treaties, and this is quite important in the context of uh, case law in the Court of Justice, uh, where we're going to have a very important judgment before the summer, is right. The generation of renewable energy is a, is a, a treaty obligation, of, and it's a treaty law, of course, is primary law. That is to say, it takes precedent over secondary legal instruments, such as the Renewable Energy Directive, which I will speak about uh, later. Uh, so there's two elements there. We have to generate uh, uh, energy from uh, renewable sources, and then we have to interconnect energy networks. The policy backdrop, of course, we could spend the rest of the weekend on, on the policy, European energy policy. Uh, I, I would highlight, right, we, we have very specific targets, the 2020 targets, and they are 20% uh, energy uh, from renewable sources by uh, 2020. 20% uh, energy efficiency, that's relative to the uh, uh, 2000, sorry, relative to 1990 uh, efficiency sources and 20% of a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's only the beginning. And uh, the current debate within the European institutions uh, is quite clearly set out in the European Energy Roadmap of 2050 in the recently published uh, green paper on the framework for climate and energy policies. And essentially what that sets out is for the European Union uh, to be carbon neutral. That is to say an 80% reduction in carbon emissions and a 55% uh, energy from renewable uh, uh, sources by 2050. I, I looked this morning at a statement by, by Minister uh, Rabbit and it was quite clear right, that the uh, how Europe is going to achieve the 2030 targets is still open for debate, and this is a, quite a, a, an important debate in an Irish context. Um, now, if we move into the marine context, 30% of all wind turbines in Europe will be located offshore by 2020, and we, we can state that as a, as a matter of fact. And uh, these figures will increase to 60% by 2030. Now, that allows uh, me to conclude, certainly in my, my paper, is when we're speaking about uh, renewable energy in a pan-European Union context, we're essentially talking about a maritime industry and uh, uh, the initiatives which are underway in the European institutions, both in the context of uh, monitoring our implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is, are going to be quite crucial uh, as to how uh, that industry uh, evolves uh, and develops within this uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the factors shaping growth, and this is just a representative list, uh, uh, clearly right, uh, the factors that have a major bearing for the industry are the quality of the resource and indeed the availability of maritime space, uh, the price of fossil fuels and indeed the demand for energy, uh, Quite clearly, uh, market and fiscal supports in the member states are, is quite crucial. 
uh, the European policy on climate change and energy security is, is, is driving, shall we say, developments in the field forward. Uh, the law is a very important part to play this, uh, particularly in relation to the targets set down under the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, the national programmes and indeed the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Uh, one issue, and we're quite familiar with this at, at, a, national, uh, at a national level, it's, it's certainly a key issue in, in, in the debate in German, uh, Germany, which is acceptability, social acceptability. Uh, the view is right uh, that offshore renewable energy, particularly offshore wind farms, are more socially acceptable uh, than their, their terrestrial equivalent. And uh, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, regulatory examples uh, to support that assertion at a pan-European Union level. I would take, or I would instance, right, the, the regulatory requirements in Germany, right, uh, where offshore wind farms can be developed in sight of the, uh, the shoreline. Um, now, moving on, right, uh, what is the status of the industry in Europe? Uh, it's, 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 it's evolving pretty rapidly. Uh, the figures uh, uh, published by the Wind Energy Association in their annual report last year is there were 69 farms up and running uh, with 2,000 uh, turbines. Uh, quite clearly, if you look at the, the second line there, uh, the United Kingdom is clearly in the lead uh, with 1,000 offshore uh, turbines. Uh, uh, now, they're going to be rapidly overtaken by, by Germany. Un under the current uh, plans in Germany, they're putting uh, 8,000 turbines into a relatively a small area of the, the North Sea. Uh, in terms of jobs, just uh, for, for comparative purposes, right, uh, the amount of jobs at a pan-European Union level will be in excess of 150,000 jobs uh, uh, involved in the offshore industry by 2020, and approximately uh, 300,000 jobs are anticipated uh, uh, 10 years later by 2030. Exponentially, uh, the industry has grown rapidly in the context of its development in the offshore environment. Uh, if we go back to 2000, right, this industry didn't exist, uh, whereas quite clearly we can see from the from the, the Wind Energy Association's report that this industry is exponentially uh, growing at a very uh, rapid scale at a pan-European Union level. In terms of investment, I, I had a look at the, the figures, right? The 2011 figures were uh, approximately three billion invested in the offshore industry, and this figure will uh, rise to 10 billion by uh, 2020. Uh, the challenges, and I, I, I've kind of summarized the challenges in offshore wind energy. Uh, first of all, it's, it's the, the approach is very much uh, a, a national approach in, in the member states, and that's quite clearly uh, uh, the scheme advanced by the Renewable Energy Directive. That is leading to a whole range of problems in relation to uh, spatial management of the marine environment, and indeed in relation to the protection of the marine environment. Uh, the, the consent or licensing processes vary enormously in the member states, and uh, I cite in my paper some examples from, from Germany and the Netherlands. Um, there is a, an absence of an intergovernmental uh, regional treaty for interconnectors in the, in the North Sea, and that's uh, uh, proving uh, uh, quite an expensive uh, uh, obstacle to the uh, rolling out of the industry in, a, in an efficient manner. Uh, the interconnections between the offshore farms and indeed uh, uh, the coastal states are regulated at a national level and this varies considerably in the member states. Uh, this is quite clearly an absence of a uniform approach to uh, marine spatial planning in the member states, and I will come back to that uh, particular issue at the, the end of my presentation. I notice the numbers are out on the slides, but I, I'm an Apple man. I'm running my, uh, my presentation. Uh, doesn't give me confidence in technology, you know, <laughs> particularly in the context of automated ships. Uh, and, uh, uh, Okay, so moving on to the, the, the case law, uh, this was all very well and good until Advocate General Bott uh, uh, published or uh, issued his opinion on the 20th of January of, of this year, 
and uh, concerned a very significant case, not only in the landscape of European energy law, but on the landscape of European law per se. And it concerned a, a, an offshore, or it concerned a wind farm in the Eiland Islands in Finland. By the way, a, a beautiful place, an archipelago up there in the top end of the, the Baltic Sea. And the particular issues in hand were that under the Renewable Energy Directive, Article 3 thereof, that provided that the member states and must meet their uh, uh, minimum national requirement targets as set out in the directive. And in this particular uh, instance, right, many member states, or indeed the, the majority of the member states, have supported uh, their national programs by means of a feed-in tariff in the member states. And in this particular case, right, uh, uh, Aelin's uh, Windcraft uh, couldn't obtain a Swedish Green Energy Certificate uh, because its energy was generated uh, uh, in Finland and uh, there was provision uh, in Sweden for a, a green certificates for Norwegian suppliers under a bilateral energy uh, a agreement but there was no such agreement in place with Finland and uh, Advocate General uh, Boss in a, a judgment which is uh, or an opinion which is published in, in, in French, uh, there's only an English translation, uh, uh, unofficial English translation, and you know, I worked on, off the French text uh, myself, ruled uh, quite clearly that Article 3.3 of the Directive, and he, his view was a measure amounting to uh, equivalent to a quantitative restriction under Article 34 of the Treaty uh, on the Functioning of the European Union, and was therefore uh, the, this provision in the Directive uh, was contrary to European Union law in, in so far as uh, these national schemes uh, uh, were an obstacle to the free movement of uh, goods and services uh, across, the, across the Union. Uh, quite a dramatic decision on the landscape. I, I, sh I should add, right, that the, the opinion of the, the Advocate General uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, set a precedent for the, for the, the, for the court, and uh, we will have a, the judgment of the court on this particular issue in, in, in due course and uh, hopefully before the summer. Was there any surprises in the judgment? I, I think if you look at giant cases 2004 to 2008, uh, the Essen Belgium case, where uh, the same Advocate General uh, handed down his opinion, right, that. Uh, 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 he's, he's quite clear, right, that the attainment of uh, renewable energy targets uh, uh, in the member states is not a grounds to derogate from the free movement of goods provisions in the treaties. Uh, secondly, that the, the reductions of emissions can be achieved by imports as well as domestically produced renewables. And uh, thirdly, he rejected the, the proximity and the security of supply arguments. By the way, in my view, I, I think, right, uh, Certainly, on, on, on my understanding of, of his opinion, right, uh, I, I don't think those, those particular arguments are canvassed adequately. Uh, finally, uh, you could say he's adopted a teleological approach. Uh, what counts, in his view, is the protection of the environment and the free movement of goods and not uh, national uh, sponsored programs which are uh, contrary to the free movement provisions uh, uh, within the treaties. Um, so, an exciting time in terms of uh, offshore energy. I, I, I'll also touch on ocean energy, and I'm, I'm conscious, right, that with all the students here this morning, I'm not so sure if they're here this afternoon, huh? from, from, from the polls. We have one or two. Uh, ocean energy generally falls into four classifications uh, with waves, uh, tides, and marine currents, salinity gradient, and temperature gradients. And, uh, uh, What's uh, significant is the European Commission have published a, an impact assessment on, uh, in relation to the actions that need to be taken uh, to deliver on the potential of ocean energy in the European seas and oceans by 2020 and beyond. Uh, this was published in January. And uh, it is the view of the European Commission as set out in the impact statement uh, that uh, uh, the previous approach or the heretofore approach of a, a case by case approach using the laws that apply to the petroleum aquaculture other offshore industry developments is a is a is a certainly a challenge if not an impediment for the future development of the uh, ocean energy sector uh, secondly uh, that Belgium, Germany, and Sweden, by way of example, apply different consent processes 
in their territorial seas compared to their exclusive economic zones. I myself don't uh, uh, fully understand that, but it kind of struck me this morning in the context of the, um, of the, the foreshore uh, amendment bill 2013, where we're drawing a, a clear distinction between the near shore and other offshore maritime areas, right, that this may pose a problem in the context of rolling the energy uh, sector forward within this jurisdiction in the future. Uh, thirdly, uh, that red tape in the member states amounted to 14% of project costs, and uh, they cite uh, Scotland and Denmark as having a more rational approach or a one-stop licensing uh, a shop approach to the, the regulation of the industry. And uh, it, it flagged a, a key issue for us uh, within this jurisdiction, which is there are different approaches to maritime spatial planning in the member states. And again, it gives examples of Germany, Portugal, Sweden, and the Netherlands, and indeed in the United Kingdom. Ireland is in, cited as a state that was developing approach to maritime spatial uh, planning similar to uh, uh, Denmark and Italy. Um, I, I was very disappointed when I got out to Annex. Uh, uh, one of the impact assessments in the context of the proposed EU measures on ocean energy, there seemed to be very little of substance. Uh, essentially, there's two phases. In phase, in phase one, there's the uh, setting up or the establishment of a, an ocean energy forum to be achieved by 2016. Uh, the drafting of a strategic uh, roadmap uh, the same year, uh, and followed by phase two, uh, uh, a European industrial initiative, and indeed the, the publication of guidelines to facilitate the implementation of relevant legislation and to assist with maritime spatial planning. For my life, I do not understand right, why we're going to publish uh, guidelines on uh, the implementation of relevant legislation and to assist with maritime spatial planning in 2017. I mean, surely this is the, the most pressing and the most critical issue. So I, 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 this is one of the issues I have taken, uh, taken up in, in, in my paper. Um, moving on to my last topic, which is the direct draft directive on maritime spatial uh, planning and integrated coastal management. Um, I'll just highlight a number of points, and I'll, I'll try and pick up on some of the comments Val made this morning, and indeed some of the issues flagged by Anne-Marie in her presentation. Uh, by, by way of a general comment, I would say this is, this is extraordinarily late in a pan-European context. Uh, coastal zone management had a, a clear statutory basis in, a, in, in the United States in 1972, that is over 40 years ago, yet at a, a pan-European Union level, we're just talking about the, uh, a, a draft instrument. By the way, it's, it's a draft instrument which was uh, uh, published in, in haste and, uh, by, and adopted by the Commission and sent forward to the, the Council and the Parliament, and indeed uh, at its first reading in the Parliament, it was returned to uh, uh, to the Parliamentary Committee for more substantive uh, proposals for amendment. Um, what are the objectives? And uh, I list some of the objectives of maritime spatial planning and integrated coastal zone management set out in the draft directive. Firstly, to secure the energy supply of the Union by promoting the development of marine energy sources, uh, the development of new and renewable forms of energy, the interconnection of energy networks and energy efficiency. That's a, a key issue or a key objective under the draft directive. Uh, D, ensuring the preservation and protection and the improvement of the environment. And quite clearly, it goes on to talk about good environmental status. And that has to be achieved under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive by 2020. Uh, it must also ensure climate resilient coastal and marine areas. Now, what I haven't mentioned here is that uh, it quite specifically mentions right, that your maritime spatial plan and your integrated coastal zone management has to address fisheries and aquaculture and indeed shipping. So the, the, the debate we had this morning about the separation out of certain sectors right, at a national level would strike me as 
clearly inconsistent with the scheme that's been set out at a pan-European Union level in the context of the draft directive. By the way, right, the draft directive, the draft directive when adopted, will take precedence over Irish law. So we'll have to bring our laws into conformity with this in due course. Um, what must member states do? And I've just picked out two or three uh, features. Right, member states must establish and Im implement uh, spatial plans and integrated coastal management strategies uh, in the member states, and these are reviewable every six years. Uh, their geographical scope, uh, they apply to all marine waters, and uh, we have to be quite clear in that, right? Uh, wherever the state exercises uh, coastal state jurisdiction uh, in relation to the marine environment, whether it's near shore, territorial sea, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, uh, continental shelf, outer continental shelf, you have to have a, a marine spatial plan, and indeed in relation to the land-sea interface, you need a, an integrated coastal management strategy. Um, that's quite important, I think, and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back and look at the, the, the foreshore, um, the foreshore uh, amendment bill in its current form to see uh, where, where the gaps are. Uh, the features, right, plans and strategies must also take into account, and I only list these by way of example, installations for the extraction of energy and the production of renewable energy, submarine cables and routes, and nature conservation sites. It also clearly lists their aquaculture and fisheries. So you cannot produce a marine spatial plan or an integrated coastal zone management uh, strategy and leave the sector out. And uh, uh, quite clearly, that only will be uh, at odds with the scheme set out, the draft directive, but it's clearly uh, contrary to the, this whole principle of integration, which is central. Uh, a very important feature, and this was highlighted by Anne Marie in her paper this morning, is the draft directive clearly sets out a, a fundamental role for uh, public participation. And there is a precedent, a very important precedent in the context of the Arles Convention, uh, which is implemented now fully in this jurisdiction. And uh, this public part participation extends to data collection and the exchange of, inf of information. Uh, member states must also cooperate and coordinate on issues of a transnational nature. So clearly uh, here in, in the south of Ireland, we have to uh, cooperate and coordinate with our our sister member states on the other side of the Irish Sea, uh, the United Kingdom, and likewise in relation to the, uh, shall we say, the Southwest with our, our neighbours, uh, 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 France and Spain. Um, I, I won't mention the, the new planning and consent architecture for the development of the marine area. Uh, this was canvassed extensively by Anne Marie this morning. Uh, I can take some questions on it. You know, this brings me to, to my conclusions. They're kind of tentative uh, conclusions. Obviously, my paper is only in, in draft form. And uh, I, I think offshore renewable energy right, is clearly associated with the, 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 the broader debate of energy security and CO2 emissions. We had the extraordinary report on, on climate change, or the second part of uh, the report published on Monday last. And this is a global debate. Our, our Taoiseach will be attending at the United Nations in September uh, an especially convened session to discuss this. And obviously, uh, renewable energy is a, is a key contribution that's going to be made uh, by the European Union. Um, the stability and clarity, I think the jurisdictional framework is quite clearly and quite stable in the context of the Law of the Sea Convention, and Owen addressed that in his paper this morning. Um, what's we're, what we're missing is a pan-European approach to the development and regulation of the offshore, uh, offshore industry and uh, clearly the compatibility of national support systems under the Renewable Energy Directive with the free movement of goods now is, is a major issue which is going to be addressed by the Court of Justice in the context of the, 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 the cases before the Court. Uh, in the interim, our intergovernmental agreement with our near neighbours is in abeyance. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, the, the outcome of the case will have a, a, a large bearing on the conclusion of any such uh, agreement in due course. Um, there's an absence of a European-wide policy in sustainable energy production, and this clearly has to be reconciled with the, the free movement of goods and, indeed, competition policy. It also has to be uh, reconciled with the higher level of protection of the the environment. And I, I, I would finish with a number of general points. And uh, uh, 
Like, there is no doubt right, that cumulative and transboundary environmental effects are, are increasing, and uh, there is going to be increased conflict uh, between the automated ships and indeed all the other activities uh, that take place in the marine environment. Uh, the marine environment is a, is a very busy place, uh, particularly the European uh, coastal marine environment. Um, I myself, right, have. Uh, I, I myself, right, I'm, I, I, I'm concerned, right, in relation to how we can reconcile uh, what we're doing in offshore renewable energy with uh, the implementation of ecosystems-based management approach uh, under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, there, two years ago, uh, myself and Owen were in Germany uh, for a major uh, German conference to discuss uh, climate change, and the, there was a major session there in relation to offshore renewable energy. And indeed, we, we met the engineer that's rolling out these uh, huge, ambitious uh, plans in Germany. And uh, you know, certainly, she was very clear, right, as to how the, this program was going to be run forward on tracks in Germany. Uh, but I, I certainly recall the question uh, that Owen posed about drilling 8,000 holes on the German continental shelf. Uh, how, how could they reconcile that with ecosystems-based management of the German marine uh, environment under the Marine Strategy uh, Framework Directive? Quite clearly, where we set down uh, certain targets in relation to seafloor integrity. So, um, this is an issue, I think, in relation to uh, two opposing uh, European objectives. Um, Finally, uh, the key element in, in, in the delivery is going to be the draft directive on maritime spatial planning and coastal zone management, and that's going to be a, a long overdue and clearly of crucial importance in ensuring that we have a very stable uh, planning and development uh, environment for the offshore uh, sectors in general and the offshore energy sector in particular. I have a number of publications on it, and uh, these are quite clearly... Uh, available here. I've, I've looked at ecosystems-based management or the EU regulatory answers really blowing in the wind. And this came out last year where I was trying to reconcile continental shelf development and indeed offshore wind energy. And uh, I think some of the arguments are still uh, very valid. I've also looked at the energy sector in Germany and particularly the actors, the legal instruments and the decision-making procedures that are being applied in Germany. And uh, I, I will have a a more elaborate paper based on my very short presentation here this afternoon. I'm ar around all evening, so I'm delighted to see all my friends from the, the marine sector, and uh, it's great to be a participant on a, a tremendous panel. So Roach's Point, uh, one of my favourite places uh, here in Ireland and the Irish coast. Uh, very happy memories racing out of Cork Harbour. Uh, kind of first point of departure and always our, our landfall uh, coming back. So very nice to be back in Cork. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we might if, uh, take one or two questions from the floor. Any questions for Professor Long? From the Attorney General's office, please.
Okay, and uh, I'm delighted to flag the issue because it's a key issue. You know, and I, and I, like, I can't really understand how we have to keep learning the same lessons at a pan-European Union level. We quite clearly need a very coherent European Union policy on renewable energy. I, 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 I'll give you an example, right? We, we heard this from the legal advisor at a conference in the Netherlands two weeks ago. Huh? And he told us, right, that he had five lawyers within the legal division there just working on, uh, on, uh, on law of the sea issues. He says most of their time is taken up in relation to offshore wind farms. He says, right, uh, uh, the Belgians have developed an offshore wind farm in an inshore navigational area, and he says, right, that has uh, impeded uh, uh, cabotage and coastal traffic into the Netherlands. And he says, right, that the, the Germans on the other side have developed a uh, 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 an offshore, uh, offshore wind farm in an area that's being is disputed between the two states. Uh, we don't have any regional treaties in relation to how to deliver this. It's essentially national uh, uh, programs. It's almost a free for all. And uh, like one of the issues which has driven momentum in, in Germany is German, Germany has moved away from the nuclear industry. So and you know their big concerns are energy security. They're, they're an energy-intensive economy, same as ours, our neighbours next door. So this is of primary importance, shall we say, in their overall perspective. But it, it has really, the approach at a, at a member state level lacks coherence. It's not a rational poor approach. I mean, it, it's a fundamental norm now in international and environmental law, particularly as it applies to the marine environment. That is, it has to be a transnational uh, approach. It has to be a sea basin approach. Uh, you know, this is uh, why we have a marine strategy framework directive which is set up on a regional basis. So it's, it, it doesn't make any sense, right, if we if we're, uh, have a, a, a Wild West uh, uh, first out in, in relation to the uh, development of the resource, particularly when this is funded in the main by state aid. Huh? Uh, so what's going to be really interesting is in the context of the judgment that we're expecting this summer uh, is that like there's just kind of two options for the court, right? One is they say it's a derogation under Article 36 of the treaty on, on environmental grounds and they expand out the list of derogations. They have done this previously and one or two, well, I, I know of three cases where they have done that. Or alternatively, they, they come back and say, support uh, the, the opinion by Advocate General Bott, which is it has to be a pan-European approach. And that would mean a complete rethink. Uh, one of the issues I was, I, I, I was concerned about, which is uh, addressed indirectly in his opinion, which is invalidation of permits under the existing scheme, and he's quite clearly um, against retroactive invalidation. So existing permits will, will uh, what's foreseen within his opinion, uh, uh, existing permits will operate as granted, but the new perspective will have to be a pan-European Union perspective. If you're generating uh, energy here in Ireland, you should be able to sell that into the Swedish or the Finnish or indeed the German market uh, at a pan-European Union level. That's his, that is his argument. Huh? Um, as always, time is against us. Um, if uh, at the end of the session we have some, some more time, I'll take some more questions for Professor Long, but I, I would encourage you all to take him up on his offer and, and I'll talk to him again either after the session or indeed this evening. Our next speaker today is Helen Noble. Helen heads up Campbell Johnston Clark's Irish office and is a partner at Campbell Johnston Clark globally. Helen has extensive experience in admiralty, maritime and transport law and has practiced as a maritime lawyer, lawyer in both the UK and Ireland for 17 years. Helen is currently serving as the president of the Irish Maritime Law Association. Helen's a director of the Port of Waterford and is actively involved in UNCTAD. Helen? Well, I'm going to have fun now trying to find the slides. <laughs> A few seconds. There's one other way. Well, hold on, no, no. There's one way we can do this, which is uh, it supports the co concept yeah, of unmanned ships, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Do you know where the folder is? Yeah. 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 Yeah
it's here. Yes. Oh, sorry, it's, it says, read what it says, says on the tin. <laughs> presentations. Is it here? It's presentations for... This one? Yeah. Sorry, Helen, I'll pick a prayer. Yeah. And I'll just press this for you here. There we go. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here th uh, this afternoon. I just want to thank uh, Dr. McIntyre, like my other fellow speakers, for inviting me. It's uh, an absolute honour, particularly to be uh, presenting along some very highbrow level speakers. So I'm very honoured to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you in the next, I'm going to, I'll do it in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll try and be quick because I'm it's conscious I stand between. Well, I can. Yeah. I'm conscious I stand between you and your tea break. But anyway, um, I want to talk about um, sort of pollution by the shipping industry gen generally, and talk about sort of the vessels that are currently in operation and what will be the next generation of ships that we're likely to see. So unlike um, the talks we've had up until uh, now today. Um, my talk to you is actually going to be very much on a sort of a commercial response to um, environmental law that has developed at both an international and a European level um, and to give you um, the perspective hopefully from um, the shipping uh, operators. When we talk about pollution by the shipping industry we could be talking about uh, many different aspects of pollution. Um, obviously, the first thing that always springs to mind uh, is oil pollution, and I'll go on to talk a little bit about oil pollution shortly. But also, we have, obviously, exhaust gas emissions. Um, we also have acoustic pollution from the shipping industry. Um, the noise levels given off by the shipping industry uh, has very harmful effects for uh, marine life um, and is often... Uh, not really uh, the first consideration when we talk about uh, marine environmental issues. Ballast water, um, and I'm not going to go into depth, there's a lot of regulation about ballast water, but other than to say, um, we talked uh, about uh, today, sort of, uh, I think Owen gave the wonderful quote of a river. Uh, you don't stand twice in a river because it, obviously it's never the same. Well, there's some kind of analogy with ballast water. Uh, ballast water, it's water that's taken on by ships in one uh, coastal state. Uh, the ship then moves to a whole other jurisdiction and then discharges that ballast water. The ballast water that's taken on contains a whole marine life and environment and it's then discharged that marine life within the ballast water into a whole new environment. So that's a major concern as to the impact that uh, the discharge, loading and discharge of ballast water has on different marine environments. Also, um, a, a major environmental issue, again one that we don't think about, is that ships can actually strike mammals. Um, uh, some of our whales are endangered species because of being struck by moving vessels. Finally then, um, another aspect of pollution by the shipping industry, uh, grey water. Uh, grey water is sort of like a discharge from ships, from uh, washing up, from uh, washing uh, showers, all of that uh, sort of disposed water. Then there's bilge water and obviously solid waste pollution. I'm just going to focus on two aspects today, um, this afternoon. The first is oil pollution and the second is exhaust gas emissions. And we'll primarily focus on the second of those exhaust gas emissions because it's that area that is dictating largely the changes in the ships that are going to be constructed in the near and the medium to future. The reason I want to talk about um, oil pollution though, um, when we talk about the shipping industry and we talk about pollution by the shipping industry, as I say, the first thing that springs to mind is oil pollution. Um, Professor Howarth said this morning that the European reaction on the environmental uh, law had been uh, very much um, to act as a um, sort of a reactionary approach to incidents as they happen. So the law that has developed on the environmental front at, uh, at a European level started to be uh, started with preventative law and then has gone more to precautionary. Well, the shipping industry is now different. Um, 
perhaps just a slightly even slower. Um, the shipping industry tends to have reacted slowly to various significant oil pollution uh, incidents. And the first main body of international and European law that we had on marine environmental issues was a response uh, to major pollution incidents. It's only some many subsequent years later that we actually then start to look at air pollution. So oil pollution, the nightmare begins. This is a picture of the uh, Torrey Canyon, um, 18th of March 1967, one of the, still one of the most major oil spills uh, in history today. The Torrey Canyon uh, really started the international shipping world and the shipping lawyers around the world to focus on uh, oil pollution. But the focus was on developing a liability regime um, around the world so that we could respond to major oil pollution incidents but put the blame on someone's head. Following on, we then have the Argo Merchant, December 1976. Again, another uh, major incident and one of the, uh, today still one of the 12 biggest oil spills uh, in history. The Amoco Cadiz, again, another major oil spill. The ship uh, split, you can see there in two, but on the second picture you can see the size of the oil slick. The Atlantic Empress, uh, probably I think is uh, again one of the ten major oil spills um, that we've had um, and the damage was uh, absolutely catastrophic. Exxon Valdez, when we think about oil pollution from ships, everyone always thinks about the Exxon Valdez. In fact, the Exxon Valdez was, is in terms of seriousness of incidents, I think it's probably ranked about the 54th largest oil spill in the world. It doesn't compare to some of the other um, incidents, but it's absolutely uh, on the tip of everyone's tongue because in that case, Exxon uh, were um, fined I think initially the fine from the US was about five billion. It's obviously reduced significantly on appeal, but it certainly uh, was food thought. And obviously the cleanup uh, involved in that was very, very significant. Another major incident, um, probably not as major from a world's perspective, but certainly from a UK and Scottish perspective, the Brer uh, oil spillage in January of 1993. Um, again, uh, led to uh, widespread concern with regard to the ability of the shipping industry to respond to major oil cleanups following spills. There's the Sea Empress in February 1996, a huge, huge loss of life to uh, local wildlife. Bringing us forward to two modern day incidents that have been uh, led to major change both an international and a European level. The first one is the Erica um, in December of 1999, and then the Prestige in November 2002. Just to, uh, to go back to the Erica, the Erica uh, incident led to the IMO uh, developing a whole new regime in relation to oil spillage and followed by uh, European legislation, we had three packages that came out of the Erica disaster, the Erica 1, the Erica 2, and the Erica 3. So just, to, just to talk about um, MARPOL. MARPOL, um, this, when we talk about international maritime law, we have what's uh, now referred to as four pillars of international maritime law. The first is SOLAS, so the prevention of, uh, uh, protection of life uh, and safety at sea. We have MARPOL, which is the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. We have STCW, which uh, is in relation to uh, working conditions of seafarers. Um, and then we have, more recently, the Maritime Labour Convention, which came into law last year. They're the four pillars, safety, pollution, and uh, then uh, labour uh, matters. So MARPOL... MARPOL was adopted in uh, 1973. 
There's been a series of subsequent um, amendments and updates. It's now generally MARPOL is updated by a tacit agreement uh, procedure, so it avoids the need when there's every time there needs to be an amendment for it going back to the drawing board and having to be approved by all of the um, parties that are signatories to, um, to and parties to MARPOL. MARPOL, it addresses pollution from ships uh, in the various different polluting uh, possibilities. So we, it prevent, uh, deals with pollution by oil, noxious liquid substances, uh, sewage, garbage, and prevention of air pollution. MARPOL applies to 99% of the world's merchant tonnage, so it's fairly well universally applied. Okay, so in Annex 1 deals with uh, oil pollution and it deals with uh, the design of ships to prevent pollution from oil tankers. This was the reaction uh, by the industry to the various significant oil, uh, oil tanker disasters that we've just seen. In 1992, it made it mandatory for tankers of 5,000 dead weights and more, um, ordered after the 6th of July, 93, to be fitted with double hulls. And that was uh, then applied to existing ships. Uh, they either have to be converted or taken out of service if they reach 30 years old. So that, that came into uh, force uh, 6th of July, 93. The phase out of single hulls was accelerated by the Erica incident. Um, phased, uh, the phase out was upped by two stages, April 2001 and December of 2003. And effectively from 2003, there was a ban on the carriage of heavy gas oil in single hull tankers of 5,000 dead weights um, after the 5th of April 2005 and in single hull tankers um, uh, from uh, 2008 onwards. Further revisions were made to uh, Annex 1 of Marpol post the Prestige incident, um, enforced from uh, 5th of April 2005, with the phasing out of single hulls to be completed by 2010. The EU, um, just for completeness, um, reflected the package, uh, packages contained within MARPOL, as I said, following the Erica incident, issued uh, effectively three packages, Erica 1, Erica 2, and Erica 3. And the Erica 1